What does it take to survive several months alone in the wilderness? Hey, my name is Dr. Timogen Tan, and I'm a physician, army veteran, and finalist on Alone Season 9. And in this live series, I will be recapping each week's episode on Alone Season 10, adding my two cents and observations, and then opening up the floor live to your questions. So whether you're a fan of the show, interested in survival, medicine, and science behind survival, this series is for you. So I'll be hosting these lives every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if this is your type of thing and you want to find something in between those episodes, consider subscribing and click that notification so you know when I'm going live. So before we even start, let's introduce Season 10's new contestants. So I'll add it right over here. We have Mikey coming up. So what we'll do with this is we'll introduce um, each character and, um, and also what did we find from that first pre-episode, that before the launch episode? And doing a little bit of observations and uh, investigations on what they chose, why, what would be challenging for them, and what would be actually really advantageous for their choices. So we're starting with Mikey. He is 31 from Georgia, USA. And one thing that I want to say off the bat, and I want you to make these observations with each and every participant from now till the end of time for alone is look at their backstory, look at where they're coming from and see what kind of hardships that uh, they've had in the past, because that will dictate how hard they're able to push. And in addition to that, their perspective on how hard this experience will be. So uh, Mikey off the bat in the pre-launch episode, he talks about growing up in um, a not so good financial situation, you know, having to build his own home in the woods, having to hunt small game. Uh, and now he is a carpenter uh, trying to um, provide for his kids. So again, we, we see some themes there where if he is suffering out there, he knows that number one, as a kid, all the way, way back when, he has put in so much time and effort and creativity to make a living and also to make his situation livable. So I'm really excited to see the creativity side of uh, Mikey and also uh, to learn more about what drives him because that's what I really need to see if these guys can make it to the end because every single one of them, especially season 10, these men and women are exceptional in their skills. Maybe the some, some of the best we've seen yet. Mikey is bringing a sleeping bag. He is bringing a cooking pot. He is bringing a ferro rod, paracord, multi-tool, axe and saw, bows and arrows, fishing line, and hooks and snare wire. So just off the bat, looking at this, it is pretty standard. Your sleeping bag, I know there are some people that says, hey, you can build a sleeping bag with the tarp that they give you out there. If it's wet, damp, and even if you have that tarp close to your skin, that provides a lot of moisture. And you don't know what you're getting out there. You can be dropping and it's raining day one, just like what happened to me in season nine. Um, so definitely recommend a sleeping bag. Things to consider for your sleeping bag is, is it going to be cold and wet or is it going to be cold and dry? Typically down has a little more loft to it. So a little fluffier. That means that um, it's a decent insulator. Now, if it was wet, um, then you would want to consider options of does your sleeping bag have a built-in Gore-Tex or waterproof layer on top of it? Um, or should you be doing the fill with something synthetic because they're easier to dry and even when they're wet, they're okay. There are some versions of down now that are hydrophobic, which means that uh, the they're coated with something that repels water. So that's better than nothing. So that plus uh, a Gore-Tex layer on top of your sleeping bag works. You can also spray it as well. But uh, one caveat for spraying your sleeping bag or having a Gore-Tex uh, cover is the moisture content. So things to consider. But if you are super creative and you have the money and you have the resources, you can do what Juan Pablo did in season nine of Alone. And that guy had one of the best sleeping uh, bag setups. He had an outer synthetic. So not only was uh, the shell a little bit waterproof, the insulation was, again, more resistance uh, and would rebound to getting damp. And on the inside of that, a second layer sleeping bag that was down. So he had something that I would imagine would be graded down to minus 60. So as your shelter, you could probably just put something up like a tarp and be okay most of the season. 
Now for cooking pots, we will talk about some of the different options that are mentioned in uh, these uh, in the pre-launch videos because we have options for pots and pans, but most specifically materials. So should you go cast iron? Should you go titanium, stainless steel? Uh, or sh should you do like a mix? So on season nine, I brought a mix. So we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Uh, ferro rod, that's pretty standard. So if you are not super proficient in every single environment, in every single condition, um, a ferro rod or a ferrocinium rod is a good idea to bring because that would ensure for the most part, if you are able to gather some good tinders that you'll have a fire so you can purify your water, not getting dehydrated because again, people typically aren't eating or drinking that first day um, and uh, would need that boiling water to purify um, their, their water source. Paracord, awesome. I have hints on this season that uh, paracord um, can be used for nets. So uh, I think people are gonna be fishing doing trot lines and making nets. So paracord can be used for your shelter and you can remove that inner strand to use as nets as well. For multi-tools, um, again, if you are fishing and you are doing a lot of different things with snares and traps, a good item to have. One thing that you can do with your multi-tool is you can kind of modify the tools that you're not gonna use out there. So instead of having a flathead screwdriver, I had a chisel. Instead of having a smaller flathead screwdriver, I made a blade, 11 blade surgical knife. So I could use that on only surgical things that I would do on myself and uh, things for maintenance around my hands and fingers. For your ax and saw, again, it looks like Mikey is setting himself up for success for building stuff. So uh, axes are great. It's my preference. That's what I brought on season nine. And saws are pretty darn efficient, especially if you're getting lots of lots of wood, thick wood for, um, for the winter, for fire. Now, it doesn't mean that you absolutely need it, but it does uh, reduce the calorie intake. But at the same time, if you know how to reduce your calorie intake by using some mechanical advantage, so maybe just putting a notch in whatever you're breaking and put, wedging it between two trees, and walking forward uh, with it on your hips, you can snap that easily. So that's what I was doing. I was notching maybe three hits, three to four hits with my ax and then using that to break the majority, I would say 90% of uh, my shelter builds and also my firewood. Now for bows and arrows, again, hint, hint, I think big game is on the menu. We've heard in previews that moose and um, also black bear is on the menu. So that plus small game, bow and arrows, if you are proficient with this is a no-brainer and fishing line and hook again no-brainer because uh that they're they're on lakes so big big fish on the menu and then snare wire also a good idea for for not only shelter building but uh for catching squirrels and and hares one of the things that i wish i did more of if i was in in, in squirrel area was making squirrel poles so highly effective ways to uh get squirrels you just have them between trees kind of at chest level or above at an angle with multiple snares. So it's kind of a highway between their favorite trees. And if you do that, you look up, you see some nests and you're able to put a bunch of squirrel poles. Uh, for squirrels specifically, that is so much more effective than putting ground snares. So I've put like hundreds of um, ground snares, about I think 120 on season nine. Um, and compared that to my, my squirrel poles, the little amounts that I did, my squirrel poles gave me more food than those ground snares. So something to think about if you are trapping out there. Now, next guy, we have Taz. So uh, Taz is from Brazil. He is 35, currently living in Massachusetts. I'm moving to Maine this, uh, well, actually in two weeks. All my stuff over here is boxed up. So um, maybe we'll, we'll link up for some view parties. I'm excited about that. Anyways, he grew up with a lot of primitive skills and fishing. So I'm excited to see what he does uh, to procure food from him. And I see on this image, he does have um, some muck boots or some rubberized boots. So I, I think he'll be doing a lot of fishing. Now, his gear selection is interesting. Um, along with the sleeping bag, cooking pot, ferro rod, paracord, all that standard stuff, um, he does have an extra tarp. Now, some people have been poo-pooing an extra tarp since uh, a lot of uh, participants use their camera tarp for their main shelter. Um, but we saw in season nine, like Adam, depending on what that tarp is made out of, 
he may have a master plan to use it for some particular reason. Is he going to use it for a boat? Is he going to use it for a shelter? Is he going to use it for something else? Um, one thing I do recommend if you're kind of using a tarp for multiple different uh, reasons is think about shelter and preserving as much insulation and vapor kind of condensation, not condensation specifically, but the heat from um, the, the vapor of your body. So one thing that I was very glad that I did is I basically slept inside two or three shelters when I was on alone. I had my main natural debris shelter. I had a tarp on top of that that uh, made sure there was no rain on, on top of that debris that uh, made it wet. And in addition to that, on the inside, I had um, kind of a hooch tent. So a little A-frame tent on top of my, my um, sleeping bag. So that provided multiple layers of insulation and trapping in that heat before it escapes up. So in addition to that, one thing that I probably would have done if I had more tarp is I would probably have made a bivy bag plus that little A-frame tarp, plus a waterproofing tarp on top of my whole shelter in addition with the debris. Really making sure that you're, you're waterproof on the top, waterproof on the side, and having at least a foot or two of insulation on the walls. Um, so I'm curious to see what he uses his tarp for. I know Adam from season nine used his tarp for a bunch of different things, so that's gonna be super exciting. Um, bows and arrows, fishing line and hooks. Again, all these guys and uh, girls, or women, uh, know what they're doing and know how to use their equipment. So I'm excited to see how much game we get. And I hint, hint this week, uh, there was two episodes uh, or last week, there was two episodes dropped. So tomorrow or Wednesday, I'll be doing another live just like this about episode one. So I'm excited to talk about that, but I won't get into too much details for this one. Next we have Anne and she is another heavy hitter, strong contestant over here. Um, she, I watched uh, her 10 items video and it looks like she's going with down a minus 40. And I think that's the bare minimum because what happens when you have a lot of starvation, lose a lot of body mass, um, you may be sick is the cold doesn't feel the same. You feel a lot more cold. Things feel chilled to the bone. And a lot of these contestants are right on the water. So they're going to get a lot of moisture, a lot of convection from that uh, high winds so they'll be cold. So minus 40, I think, is the bare minimum. And Anne mentioned um, for her cooking pot, she wants to go stainless steel. She specifically mentioned uh, she did not want the taste of cast iron. Um, and in the past, uh, if you look at um, Clay Hayes from uh, season, season eight and then uh, some of my cohort from season nine, they wanted to do the, um, the heavy, heavier metals, so the cast iron, for their cooking. The thought process behind that is you can do a slow cook. Now, stainless steel, a lot lighter. You can move it around. And again, when we're thinking about cooking, in my mind, if I am cooking, I'm probably doing things outside of cooking while my things are on the fire. So um, on average, I was probably boiling my stuff on a low simmer to two to three hours anyways. So um, would I have it would have been super advantageous for me to get a cast iron pot? Probably not. Since I was doing other things, I may have been making snares or processing firewood or something like that. So I think it's okay to go without uh, a cast iron, especially if you're planning on using it as a little container to fetch water, to keep water close to you and to collect things in. But again, you can use other things for collection. I use my 6XL boxers for my main berry pouch and I was able to hold about anywhere from seven to 10 pounds. Of berries in it. So again, standard stuff, ferro rod, paracord, multi-tool, axe, saw. Um, let me know in the comments, would you, if you were to pick one or the other axe or saw, because I'm so interested in people's kind of experiences with both, because I think the next challenge for me personally is, can I do everything that I need to with a saw and not an axe? Because I love processing wood with my axe, and typically I don't make log cabins or anything like that, so I don't process uh, a lot of wood that's more than wrist thick bows and arrows fishing line and hook if you saw her videos uh she's got a good shot so excited to see some small and big game from this contestant next we have melanie 55 from new york also east coast so hopefully we will make our way up there for uh collaboration in the near near future sleeping bag cooking uh pot fair rod and one of the things that is a little different than everyone else because again, all these people are great shots. They've had experience trapping. They've had experience um, fishing. Is the two rations. Is it worth it? 
So what in this list is kind of um, missing or what did she switch out for? Um, one thing that comes to mind is her paracord. So paracord, yes, you can uh, use spruce roots, um, but again, you might not have that uh, inner lining for gear repair. You might not have that inner lining for um, nets. Maybe she'll make uh, a net with her, her um, fishing line, but it is a little trickier. It uh, requires a little more dexterity compared to um, paracord inner lining. So two rations. I'm not sure if we're going to see the two rations, but I am so interested to see if Melanie is able to come on one of these lives or um, at least post a comment or video on what she brought. Because again, there are standard things that are listed on the History Channel website on what you can bring for rations. Me personally, I did choose a ration and going 63 days um, alone, I think I would not have switched out my ration. And it wasn't necessarily uh, calorie thick. So I chose a uh, mix of salts, uh, rice and sugar. And my thought process behind that is that's going to get me through any sickness for at least two weeks. So dehydration, feeling lightheaded, passing out, that's what we see a lot on alone. And um, also muscle cramps, feeling fatigued is another thing. So having the, the electrolytes to supplement that is a good thing. Also, we see uh, a lot of diarrhea, getting sick, fever, fever, all that stuff. About 40% of season nine got issues like that. So having a way to rehydrate yourself with calories that are easily absorbable and making sure that you're not tapping or getting pulled because of those illness uh, was a big thing for me. And quick tidbit, if you haven't seen my previous um, commentaries on, see, on the last season, why don't you click the link over here after you're done and uh, you'll get to see that because you'll find out that rice not only is calories, simple calories that are easily digestible, just the water, not even using the rice, can be used for dysentery and rehydration. So what rations did she choose? Is she going for a gorp, uh, something that has a, a little mix of things that she might use for trapping and snaring? Um, is she going to use high fat pemmican, which is a mix of fats, berries, um, and meat? I don't know, but um, pemmican is delicious and uh, you can bring, I think, two pounds of it. Um, so maybe that's going to be her thing. It'll definitely push her uh, past the 30 days. So Alan, another fellow Canadian, he is coming from British Columbia, Canada, and um, he is a hunter fisher and a teacher. So um, this is going to be interesting because um, he teaches this on the regular to kids. And again, what are we looking for, for the character, the backstory? Because that's what I'm probably going to lean on for what pushes these people beyond that month. You know, and uh, he specifically mentions in one of his segments that he is mentally preparing for frustrations and loneliness and the act of preparing yourself and saying, what would I do or what would I do next um, if this happens is so important. The mental game for survival, long term survival is so underlooked. Um, one good book to read, um, in addition to my field guide, which is coming this summer, is Juan Pablo's Thrive Book. He has a great section on psychology and references a lot of good books. Um, so the survival psychology is so key. So we look at uh, perception. A lot of people, are they going to talk down on themselves? Are they going to see their failures as failures on their character? Or are they going to take it as learning opportunities? Are they going to laugh it off? Or are they going to have a perspective just like our first contestant of having it so rough or being or knowing someone who's having it so rough that whatever they're going through isn't that bad. And for me, that 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 both both cases were were similar because I know my friends in Kibera in one of the worst slums in the world in Kenya, uh, they have it harder than any of us on a loan on a daily basis and generationally as well. So that for me, no matter what I encountered on a loan wasn't as bad as what I figured some of my friends were going through out there. And it looks like um, one of the things that may be an inspiration for here, uh, for um, Alan, and I know uh, he mentions this briefly, is his father. So I'm going to touch base with you guys on episode one, because I think this is going to be some powerful stuff for him. So let's see what he brought. He brought a sleeping bag, cooking pot. So standard four up top, um, multi-tool axe. And it looks like this is pretty much the alone standard of what you would bring. So it looks like he's going to go 
back to basics, which isn't a bad, bad idea, you know? And one thing I did wanted to um, touch base on is Melanie. Let's just go back for, to Melanie for one second, because um, one thing that's also available to us is a little bit of a, her characteristics. Um, she is six one, everyone. So a lot of these contestants, uh, one thing that I, I also want to mention in what who you think are, are going to win and characteristics uh, you want to look at, obviously, uh, how much mass do they have on them? Because more fat lasts longer. So um, and that's just because you lose anywhere from half a pound a day to a pound and a half a day, depending on how rigorous you're hunting or what shelter uh, configuration you're going with. But at the same time, if you're really tall as well, you are going to be burning a lot. And just to think about uh, the average female, maybe around 16 to 1800 kilocalories a day, average male above 2000 kilocalories a day, just to sit and not do a whole lot. These men and women are probably burning upwards of 4000 kilocalories a day. I wouldn't be surprised if once the cold hits, they're burning um, closer to, to 6000. So if you're burning that much, you're that tall, and you have a bunch of weight to move around, you're going to be going through things faster. Um, versus if you are short, like me and Carrie Lee and Anne, uh, our metabolisms are a little lighter. And um, so if we gain a lot of weight, that's uh, definitely a bonus for us as well. Uh, Melanie, one thing that I want to, uh, to hit on is that she lives a very... Uh, traditional or historic life. She also uh, makes her own clothes. She cooks primitively. She procures food primitively as well. All I think it's, um, I'm not, don't quote me on this, maybe the 1800s or something like that, um, that uh, she chooses to, to live her life. So she has um, a skill set that I don't think anyone else this season does have. So I'm curious to see how that uh, relates to her foraging, how that relates to her preservation of food, how that relates to her approach. And one thing that I really like that she said is that she never feels alone in nature. And I think that's going to be a key because if you take that out and you're having a good time out there and you feel connected and you feel supported and if you feel surrounded, uh, that's definitely going to help her in the future. So Wyatt, Wyatt is our next guy. So he is... Uh, 50 from Ontario, Canada, right on. Um, maybe he lives close to me. I'll see if uh, we can link up. He is um, very, very impressive on his videos about trapping. So I'm excited to see what he does with his uh, snare wires and also to see if he does any fishing traps too or um, kind of trigger fishing lines for trot lines. Um, now bows and arrows, again, seems like he's a good shot, has kind of the standard multi-tool axe and saw and some paracord. So looks like uh, he's going for the um, alone standard, and I only expect good things from this group. So let's see if another Canadian can win this year. Next one, I am very excited to um, see what Luke brings, because not only does he come from a long line of survivalists, like OG parents in the survival community, uh, and basically raised in the lifestyle, especially primitive survival, um, his choices are a little different from everyone else's. So if we look at things, um, he brought a multi-tool ax and shovel. So there's another contestant who brought a shovel. So, um, ax and shovel, maybe the ax is super sharp. He's going to use it as a, a fixed blade plus digging. Um, very curious to see what a shelter is going to look like again, ideally. And one thing that I probably, uh, would have done if, if I had a little more time, foresight and experience is to search longer for um, a natural shelter. So just 10 meters away from my shelter location, there was an area that I probably would have spent maybe a third of the energy making that into my shelter with the same amount of our value and warmth. So um, shovels are really, really useful for kind of ground shelters um and building pits and that type of stuff so i'm excited to see what he does with that and again we've seen winners use shovels so let's uh see the shovels come back on season 10. in addition to that you'll notice uh for the typical three things sleeping bag cooking pot ferro rod he does not have a fer uh, ferro rod and i know some people are harping on luke for not bringing a ferro rod but i think if anyone isn't going to bring ferro rod. It's going to be Luke because he has a lot of experience using uh, primitive techniques. 
So we saw in um, a little snippets of episode one, it was fairly dry. It was fairly hot. So I think he's just going to make a board, dry it out as best as he can, and just uh, make a bunch of friction fires. So ideally, um, you would do something like what Zach Fowler did is bank his coals. So you build your fire. Once you have some really big red coals, you would put a bunch of new wood on that. And in addition to that, then you would pile on um, some uh, fresh wood, then soil or ash. And then in the morning, you'll have some charcoal and uh, coals that you can just blow into fire. So I imagine that's what uh, he would do if he's uh, saving energy. But um, to compensate from that, he is bringing a gill net and salt ration. So basically having a gill net on the go, boom, it's kind of like a vending machine. You place it in the right spot and you can get big, big fish because they're on lakes. So some lake trouts and pikes. Um, you can get things that could sustain him, like one catch could sustain him for a few days. So um, having that all set is really, really great. But again, he is dropping his paracord for it. So one net versus um, if you have paracord, maybe you could have uh, made a few nets. So we'll see how that works out. And uh, again, he has a salt ration. I imagine this is the big block of Himalayan salt. One thing that you uh, want to be careful for, and uh, something that I harped on my season, I wish more people listened to me, um, but sodium chloride, which is uh, the majority of what salt is, isn't the only salts that you need. Uh, so sodium is the big one. But potassium, magnesium are also super important. We know that from uh, season eight, Biko had a lot of low potassium when he was exiting, and that caused some palpitations, palpitations, chest discomfort. So if if you don't have potassium, number one is you'll get cramps. Number two, you can get a fatal arrhythmia, especially if you have some underlying heart issues that you may not know because you may not see the doctor a whole lot because you live your whole life in the wilderness. So um, if you're not supplementing that, number one, you're going to feel crummy. And number two, you can put your heart at risk, especially in the end stages of starvation. And magnesium is important uh, for similar reasons, but also work in combination with calcium and potassium to keep potassium inside the cells where it needs to be. So um, for my season, one of the reasons why I had a salt supplement um, is because they just met, mentioned salt. They didn't say what kind of salt. So I put all the salts that I would in a typical IV in the emergency department for one of my patients. So magnesium, potassium, and a little bit of sodium as well in a particular proportion, because you don't need as much potassium and you don't need as much magnesium. And it makes your food taste awesome. So every, every meal I had out there tasted like a home cooked meal. And um, to have my grouse um, smoked in alder, which gives it a little bit of a nutty taste, plus have it uh, salted, plus a little bit of sugar, best midnight snack for sure, for sure. And uh, feel free if you guys are having any reservations or thoughts or comments about these gear choices, just put it down in the comments. Um, I can see all your comments uh, live. So we have two over here. We're gonna save this for um, the, the Q and A at the end of this, okay? All right, so next we have Lee, also one of the guys um, that I'm very excited to see what happens. So Lee uh, grew up in Alaska, um, grew up in the deep woods. It, in his bio, he mentioned not seeing another community until he was 15. So he was hunting, trapping, fishing um, for the majority of his life. And one thing from a character standpoint, from a backstory standpoint, is he is trying to do something for his community. So it sounds like his community is locked with um, with access to maybe care, access to goods, access to resources, and he's a pilot. So his main thing is he's a one-man show for um, a chartering service for planes, and he wants to get a better plane, maybe more staff to better service community. So I'm interested in two aspects of the character and backstory. Is he going to feel uh, connected to the land because of his heritage, so his part indigenous? And um, number two, is he going to feel connected and surrounded because of that, um, that history? Number three, is that community aspect that fighting for more than himself going to be the thing that pushes him that one step further? I know a lot of people has reservations because of not only his age, but his, um, his weight. He's a skinny dude. And um, I don't think he gained any weight for the show. But again, uh, skinnier people... Um, sometimes have a faster metabolism, but um, on the general side, 
you can if you have less muscle to to move right you have less things you're trying to provide energy for so maybe if he gets food early on we'll see in episode one um maybe he can sustain that weight and just keep on keep on trucking on one thing that i would caution any skinny person trying to do this is you got to eat so um starvation rations uh when you're doing sur your survival priorities you're still building your shelter you're still hunting and all that stuff not the best idea to uh, ration off your stuff at the get-go because uh, you'll be losing weight fairly quickly. And once you get to uh, muscle breakdown, that takes a lot of weight and a lot of function off of you really quickly. So try to eat as much as you can, as soon as you can. It's psychologically hard though. So don't get me wrong. I did stash things like a squirrel. So I imagine people feeling that uh, that terror from not having that extra food in their in their backpack um not wanting to eat everything so it looks like lee's going with some standard stuff um i'm most excited to see what indigenous practices uh he brings to the table because again he has the skills he has the 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 history he has also the reason to push really far and in my personal opinion i think he's going to be one of the top three so we'll see what pans out Cade. Cade is our first cowboy. 28, our youngest contestant on season 10 from Wyoming. He is um, a really good hunter and a tracker. So one thing that he mentions in the pre-show is quiet observation. He's just going to chill out and see what he sees and sees what animal behaviors. And I'm sure Cade has hunted pretty much everything that's available to hunt to uh, the contestants of season 10. Um, but I'm sure if there's anything new, he's the type of guy that would pattern an animal really well. And patterning is kind of what you need for fishing, for hunting, for trapping. And one of the things that, um, I learned on the fly when I was on my season, cause I never hunted before and I took a bunch of shots, lost arrows at times. But, um, one thing that got me really consistent, like I would say the majority of the time I even let an arrow loose was understanding what an animal would do at a certain time. So only taking those shots and then getting that high success rate and knowing where they would be. Um, so instead of actively hunting for grouse, I knew that they would be coming to my my little river um, and they would be getting grit every three to four days. So instead of uh, actively hunting for them, I just waited around that mark and uh, set traps. I did other things during that time. Um, he has a wife and son, lives in rural Texas. And um, yeah, it looks like his sleeping bag, his choice, he went with synthetic. So that's uh, no, no wrong, wrong answer to that. So if it gets wet, easier to dry. Uh, one thing that I did notice when I was looking at his 10 item videos is uh, the shape of a sleeping bag, because that's another thing to consider. A big sleeping bag isn't always the best. So another thing uh, you want to be looking at is um, making sure that there's not a whole lot of air there, just enough to keep you comfortable. So mummy bags are typically more effective and see if there are bolsters or padding around your zippers and around the neck. So if that kind of seals you up over here and then has a hood that also seals up like this, that's a pretty good sleeping bag. If it's just a square or a rectangle, not the best because that's a lot of heat that's, um, that's going away. And one tip, for you people who are just camping, um, one thing that I absolutely love and wish I could have as an 11th item is just a metal canteen because you can just heat that up and put it in your sleeping bag and uh, that warms up your sleeping bag significantly. Now you can do the same thing with, um, with a hot rock rolled in a material, preferably a cotton or a wool, so it's not melting your stuff. And uh, that can keep you warm for hours and hours and hours. And that's what uh, we typically do as uh, paramedics, as physicians, as people on a rescue team for, for severe hypothermia. It's that first step of putting something warm in a sleeping bag, wrapping them around, and then also having a reflective layer and a tarp in a little burrito. So if we could make all that, um, you might be able to um, buy something that has a little bit of reflectiveness in, their, in your bivy or your uh, sleeping bag. That could be a really good option to um, have your shelter, the warmest part, just as your sleeping bag and um, just muck around with putting a tarp around you. Um, what else is he talking about? He talked about um, titanium for his pot. Titanium is super light. And again, if you are cooking like I would assume the majority of people are cooking, um, 
in, in their pods is boiling. Um, they would typically boil it for more than an hour if they're doing other stuff. So um, again, my preference is a little bit away from cast iron. So titanium is the lightest metal you can go with. Uh, heats up really fast, super light. You can use it as a little carrying case um, to collect berries or whatnot in. And one thing that I did want to to raise is he's got a lot of tools. So he's got his knife, 10 inch knife, looks like a big old Bowie. It's custom made, looks wicked. Um, so he might be using that as his ax slash baton. So I imagine his shelter is not going to be um, a huge shelter or uh, not require a lot of materials. So again, with a knife of that size, you can baton, you can chop wood and stuff, but I probably wouldn't go any more than wrist thick. Now, um, for the shovel, um, again, probably maybe doing a dugout shelter. So interested for that and how he potentially modified his shovels. Because that's another thing. Some of these tools can be custom made. And it looks like his knife's already custom. What is his shovel like? And um, again, he is a hunter. He's a, a tracker. And he's got all the things that he needs to get game out there. So I'm excited to see uh, what big game he stumbles upon or what big game he attracts to his site. One thing that he does um, mention is soap. And I'll quote him, 10 out of 10 times if he were to do this experience again, he would not have done it without this item. So we know that you can get sick if you're not having, um, if you're not having good hygiene. And soap, what it does is it removes the bacteria, the grit, all the nastiness from your hands itself into small, small little morsels and washes away in water. Um, but again, this is an ambiguous item as well because soap, we don't know what's in it. And my guess, and uh, we'll probably have a little commentary once PR approves this, is we'll talk about what he put in his soap. So that may be a good thing, that may be a bad thing, but from a medical standpoint, uh, I'll break it down once he is allowed to release that information. And last but not least, we have another heavy hitter, Jody, 46 from Wyoming, um, great hunter, trapper, and it looks like she grew up in the life too. Daughter, um, daughter of a log logger and uh, lived in the cabin, trapping grouse, I saw in her video, that was awesome. I want to see more grouse traps out there because um, I don't think there's a lot of people who successfully did it on previous seasons. And it looks like um, she also has some beliefs in God and faith. And that could be a great thing because one thing that I did out there is, again, you got to connect with something to, to push you, something to make you feel connected. And if it's God, if it's the ancestors of your of your past, if it's the spirits of the woods, there's got to be something that makes you feel more connected, that makes you feel like someone's rooting for you. And I think that's only going to work in her benefit. Now, she has a sleeping bag, cooking pot, a lot of the standard stuff, and it looks like she's going with uh, the alone standard over there. So really interested in seeing um, what she does. And one thing that I really like that she mentions is um, her being feral and free. So we'll see what kind of uh, stuff that she she does. Um, one thing that I am, um, I think this is going to be either a good thing, like uh, Rock House, you know, in season um, season seven, or is it going to be something that uh, puts her a little too much beyond her capabilities and her energy levels? Is a log home? She she mentioned early on in the previews that she wants to build a log house. So we'll see how that goes. Historically, it's been a, a gamble. So some people do really well with it. Some people really don't, and they don't finish it. So um, again, I don't know how uh, her tall or uh, how much muscle she has, but um, she can be burning a lot of calories just doing this in addition to her hunting and trapping. So with that, that is um, our little review of the before the launch or before the drop episode, super excited to open up, uh, to questions, um, and to any kind of trolls out there who just say like, Hey, this is like, like the worst gear choices. I would do this, this, or, or the other, because yeah, let's just talk about it. All right. So let's open it up to questions and, uh, we'll go for the question board. we got some helpful greetings. Hacks to save shelter. Oh, this is a good one. 
So what can you do to make the warmest shelter with the minimal amount of energy and resources? Um, so number one, shelter, waterproof, windproof, insulated, has a good bedding system to it. So um, if I were to do it again, like I mentioned, I would do it in an area where the majority of the work's already done. So it might be a semi dugout cave, it might be um, a big fallen tree, um, it might be a natural big old rock that I just need to put a, a, a lean to on. So looking for natural features uh, is the first thing. And I would say combine that with your hunting, trapping, and fishing when you're observing the area. Because the first few weeks, all you need is a tarp. You have a minus 40 sleeping bag. And if that area is dry and you're sleeping on your equipment, which I did as a very immediate um, sleeping pad, gives you like at least an inch or two of insulation. So you're not even having to spend energy on breaking boughs or anything like that. You have your temporary shelter. Go explore the land. Be like Cade. Observe. Be quiet. And uh, find the best shelter location. Um, looking at the wind directions for hunting and trapping, looking for highways of animal tracks, looking for where your fishing sites and resources are going to be and um, where you'll need to be going for firewood and all that and uh, make it easier in that sense. Because if you just pick a flat piece a lot and you're just building from the ground up, uh, that's going to expand the most energy in my opinion. So um, another thing is build it small. Um over and over again, and I think a lot of people who've gone through alone um, and who've made just regular shelters, I would say the majority would want to make a smaller shelter if they were to do it again. Mine wasn't big at all. Mine was about uh, nine feet by maybe 10 feet. Um, and it was enough for my camera stuff to put in there, my gear to put in there, my dry wood. And um, there was like just a little bit of walking space. And it was um, high enough that I could kind of just slouch on and put on my, my gear on the inside. Now, if I were to do it again, maybe I'll make it a little smaller, but I would, again, make that shelter within a shelter. So um, have like maybe a, a little debris, a bedding plus overhead uh, on the inside of your, your shelter so that all the heat that's immediately leaving is, get, is getting trapped there. So that's another way to do that. When I was homeless, I used the same technique with multiple um bivy bags, tarps, queen size duvet covers over myself. So I was just building shelters upon shelters upon shelters on the inside and trapping a lot of that heat on the inside. And I got down to minus 40 uh, with a bunch of snow, windows cracked open, never used the heating source while I was out there and sleeping naked every single night. So we got a comment over here. Lee is a real standout. I'm very hopeful for his success. Me too. I think uh, top five at least. So we'll see. I'm really excited to what knowledge he brings from a traditional standpoint and an indigenous standpoint to this show. Um, sleeping bags seem thin this year. Yeah. So um, again, synthetic bags don't have a whole lot of loft. And again, if you're going for that rectangular shape, whew, um, that's a lot of heat loss from the top. So uh, you can try to bevel it up, but again, you're not having that hoodie. If you have a toque and a neck warmer, that's, that's good. But if you had that plus a mummy hoodie and all of that you're exposing is this, great. Another thing is you don't want to be putting your mouth on the inside, especially when you're doing long-term expedition or survival. If you're at altitude, you can exhale almost two liters of water in, in your respirations because you're breathing fast and that's moisture coming out. So if that's inside your tent, imagine three days of just dumping two liters of water in your, in your sleeping bag. It's going to get wet. Um, it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be cold. Uh, I have a question here. Can you repurpose things like your sleeping bag? So I'm, I'm not quite sure. So I think every year um, I'm sure someone tells them what they can and cannot do. Um, so if you repurpose your sleeping bag as like maybe a tarp or I don't know what uh, you would repurpose it into like a big old park or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Depends on what production says. Next question. So, um, been waiting for a fire pit that starts out, out on the outside shelter, goes underground on the inside. The long pit is stacked with rocks. Keep shelter warm. Ooh, okay. So, what is a good way to, what is another way to make um, a fireplace that also warms up your shelter. 
So this person was saying, have a channel, cover the channel up with maybe some longer, longer pieces of um, wood or whatnot, and then uh, cover that up with, um, or rocks, and then cover that up with soil. So it's like a, a tubey. And then that tubey goes on the outside up into a chimney, and then your fire um, kind of goes through that tubey down that channel. What that does is it can heat up that earth, and it's kind of like heated flooring. That would be a really cool idea. I think um, you'll find in episode one, someone does something similar just on your regular cabin uh, build and how fireplaces um, kind of are fired on the inside and then kind of are tucked out um, and the chimneys going outside the, the shelter. So interesting idea. I think that is definitely a possibility, especially if you lay it with um, some flat rocks, you might have a little heated floor. That would be nice. Again, fire safety is super important. So um, do they have a bunch of roots there? Because um, you can be catching a fire in there. So one thing, so what can you do to avoid being lonely on a survival experience like this? Number one is relationships. So I talked about connecting with the land, connecting with the animals, connecting with your ancestors, connecting to God or whatever you believe in. Um, just something that makes you feel like you're not alone out there and everybody needs a Wilson. So actively prepare for what you're going to be making your Wilson or how you're going to be connecting. I think that's super important, whether that's your faith, whether that's a volleyball. Um, for me, it was a combination of things. Um, I knew that I wanted to, to talk to my ancestors. So I was actively talking and speaking out and asking for help. And when I would receive something, whether that's a grouse or a shelter location or something, a resource, I felt like someone had my back. And that was something that made me feel so supported. And um, I think that's something that I don't practice on a regular basis right now. And compared to how I was and feeling on alone, I felt more supported, more connected, and more surrounded by something, someone than I do in my regular day life. So actively doing that and practicing it on a day-to-day -day basis is super helpful to avoid loneliness. Another thing is it doesn't have to be a person. It can be an animal. It can be an object. I used a lot of things that I brought with me with over 12 years of a relationship with my axe, with my clothing. Not the most fanciest things, but um, again, they felt like old friends. So I brought them with me. Okay, what can you do in that transition point from fall to winter to best optimize your chance of being warm to best optimize your chances of getting food? So if it were me, I would wait a little bit and figure out what things and animals are doing. So when the heavy snows hit in Labrador, um, the forest became quiet. Normally I would hear birds, I would hear a small game, all the time. And after the first week of just heavy snows, I, I didn't hear anything. And I was still actively trying to snare things, actually trying to hunt. But if the animals aren't doing anything and they're hunkered down, you should probably be doing the same. So if you have fishing lines out, making sure that they don't get frozen or destroyed by the ice, um, and also making sure that you're just conserving. One thing that Juan Pablo talks about is intermittent uh, fasting, basically, or intermittent starvation, where he wouldn't do much uh, when he knew that there's going to be a transition time where that would be hard for all animals. And you're not really getting a whole lot of information or observation time uh, in those animals if they're hunkered down. So I'd probably observe more, wait, wait out and see what patterns uh, would get me food first. And uh, yeah, bolster up your shelter bolster up uh, your sleep system. Because again, if your shelter is more than what a few feet above what your body is, a lot of that's going to be lost, um, no matter how thick it is, and you'll probably have to have a fire inside. But if you modify your sleep system to make it thicker, 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 and that's kind of your shelter and inside a shelter, that's one way you can, uh, you can make your time really valuable in that transition. Food wise, what about food wise? So we'll circle back to that because um, I don't know what that question is. Yep. 
I hope um, this is a little spoiler for episode one, but I hope um, someone finds their arrows. Lee, Jody, and Lucas. Yep. They're on my top five list for sure. Oh, Nicole. Um, so what salts should you bring on a starvation or a preparation for starvation expedition? And like I mentioned, you want a mix of sodium, potassium, and magnesium at the least. So um, you can also supplement with vitamins as well because that'll help your body function a little bit better. Um, but vitamins, be sure if you do bring vitamins, you're not boiling it because you you denature and destroy a lot of the vitamins if it's at a boiling point. So um, ideally, what you would do is you would um, you can use your salts when you're cooking and whatnot, get it all nice and seasoned. And if you're adding vitamins to it, you can let it simmer down to uh, when it's kind of cool enough for you to hold your, your pot and then put your vitamins in there. And then that's a, a decent mix. But without those three salts, uh, and you're, if you're only using Himalayan, which is sodium chloride plus a bunch of trace minerals, it's, it's in my opinion, not super worth it if you're specifically doing it to pre prevent cardiac arrhythmias and muscle cramps. Make your food taste great, though. Ooh, great question. So does gaining weight give you an unfair advantage in a loan? So I mentioned the average weight loss. So at the least, you can be losing about half a pound a day to up to a pound and a half a day. I think that's the typical average for, for most contestants. Uh, for myself in the first few weeks, I know I was uh, losing at least a pound a day. So think about it. If you are losing literal weight pound a day, first 30 days, um, that typically is the amount of time to like settle in, get into the groove of things, get your shelter up, have a nice uh, trap line fishing setup. Um, you've lost 30 pounds. If you don't have that 30 pounds, how are you operating um, in that 30 pound deficit? Because that that's significant, you know? Um, I know me minus 30 pounds is like my almost prepubescent age um, weight. So one thing that I recommend is gaining just a little few pounds. You don't want to gain too much because then you're hauling that weight. And if you're hauling that weight, you're expending more energy. And at the same time, if you're not used to hauling that weight and it's a rapid weight gain, you're introducing a little bit of a risk for injuries as well. So at least in my opinion um, is like 20 to 30 pounds. That gives you a nice cushion for those first 30 days when you're doing stuff. And again, eating as much as you can. So you're not burning your body mass you're burning whatever you're e you're eating so that is definitely an important thing do you have reserves and how do you function off the res reserves or at an extreme deficit because after 30 days if you don't gain weight you will be at an extreme deficit even if you're hunting and getting protein Appears that production show doesn't show um, traditional religions, uh, mostly connection to nature. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, maybe they're trying to be politically correct, but uh, that's up to them. <laughs> so, should you be using protective finger wear uh, when handling your game and fish? So, again, in environments that you don't know, there can be definitely parasites in fish, definitely parasites in games, especially predators. Um, and if you are not washing your hands, if you don't have soap um, or a way to wash your, your yourself, yeah, you can be introducing stuff to your hands. Another thing that's super important is knowing where your hands go, because even if you are using gloves, if you're touching yourself or rubbing your nose or something like that, you can still be transmitting that uh, disease despite wearing gloves. So um, is it advisable? Sure, if you have it, go for it, um, especially if it's reusable. So some of the things that you're seeing is a rubberized glove that they're, they're using that's a, a working glove. So uh, yeah, I'd probably use that and then just wash it off uh, with uh, water as much as I can. What else supplied other than 10 items cameras? So what else is supplied? That is confidential information. So if production releases it publicly, then that is okay. But I cannot talk about that. Ooh, 
So should you build uh, a windbreak for fishing? So if I understand correctly, Tom Robinson, uh, please correct me if I'm talking way out of left field, is a uh, windbreak in my thinking is, do you want something in the water to break so that when the ice starts, you'll have a little bit of not jaggedy ice coming at you? If so, then yeah, that's an option. I think uh, one thing that I wish I spent more time in is investing in docks and maybe rafts. Rafts would be hard on alone season nine because the river was moving so fast. Um, but definitely a dock would have been helpful. Got some people from Brazil. What's up? Okay. How hard will it be for an elder gentleman or woman uh, to replenish nutrients and muscle mass? So muscle mass, um, typically you start to lose muscle mass after you've gone through your sugar stores, your glycogen stores, your fat stores. Um, and once you're in that transition, you are losing muscle. Um, and the scary thing is if you don't have a lot of fat on your frame and um, then it kind of your body takes that energy from the organs, uh, the organ fats, and your body senses when there's a critical low of fatty acids. So a breakdown products of fats in your bloodstream. And when that happens, it rapidly switches to protein breakdown. And when it does so, it does so aggressively. So you'll be losing a lot of weight by muscle and, you know, like half a pound a day of like muscle is quite a lot. And you start noticing that you lose function and that's what happened towards uh, the end for me too. So it is going to be hard, um, especially if you don't have a lot of game. But again, if you're replenishing with fish, some fats that uh, offers a different and preferred energy uh, than breakdown of muscle for, for energy, then that's going to be an option to sustain them. But they need to be getting food like pretty much every day. So we got a question here. What is the consistency of weight that you need to, to gain? Is it fats? Is it proteins? Is it other? So uh, let's break it down by timelines. Number one, just like how you would prepare for a marathon, you need a carb load because that's what your brain prefers is that sugar um, and carbs. So that breakdown product is what your brain functions the most clearly with. So again, um, I would make sure that I'm eating a lot of carbs in my regular, regular diet and also carb loading the day before because if that can buy me a day of clear thinking and then three days of reserves in the form of glycogen in my liver and muscles, then that gives me three days of relatively clear thinking where I can make a good plan where I need to, where I can kind of set my roots in, in my trapping, fishing, hunting, and shelter building. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't negate that because if you're saying just go into it in a keto diet, that pretty much means that you don't have a whole lot of reserves. So you're missing that three day glycogen reserve. And uh, that means you've lost three days. So no reason to do that. I do think it's a good idea to feel what it uh, is to function on ketosis. So um, typically 50 grams uh, or less of carbs is what you need to maintain ketosis. So that's what people do on the keto diet. Um, and in addition to that, um, if you're trying to visualize what 50 grams of carbs looks like, that's kind of like a white bagel, a medium sized white bagel, about uh, 250 to 280 uh, kilocalories a day. So if you're eating less than that, then you're pretty much in ketosis, which when some people, when some people say, Hey, it's not a starvation contest. I want to get a bunch of game out there. If it's mostly protein and less than 50 grams of carbs, you're going to be burning your fat. You're going to be burning your protein. So, um, I would have a combination of carbs at the get go, get that three day storage. Um, definitely heavy on the fats. So, um, ideally natural fats. Um, so you can do some oils like olive oil. I used, um, coconut oil and I also use sesame oil because it was easier to palate. Juan Pablo did a massive gain, I think over 60 pounds with um, a gallon of milk a day plus 60 ml of olive oil. So if you can tolerate that, that's great. It gives me massive flatulence and also uh, upset stomach from uh, acid reflux. So that wasn't for me. Um, and then muscle, you should also be gaining some muscle as well because uh, not only is it an emergency energy source after your fats, uh, you'll need a little bit of extra muscle to move some of that weight. But again, you're not going to try to bodybuild because the more muscle you put, there's a fine line between gaining a bunch a lot 
a bunch of weight and muscle and fats, and then kind of expending a lot of energy moving all of that. So there is a balance. So yes, you can. So can you build your own equipment and repurpose it while you're out there? Yeah, you can. <laughs> But uh, again, uh, there there is a fine line. You don't want to be cheating um, from your other contestants. But if you want to rip apart your coat to make it uh, do something else, that's a potential. That's a potential, especially if um, it meets your needs and makes your life easier, warmer, and you get more food out of it. So uh, if production says it's okay, then uh, likely it's okay. But if you do something pretty sneaky next year, I'm pretty sure they're going to have words uh, for clarification on what you bring and what you can modify. So should you build a windbreak um, when the ice is formed and you're ice fishing to prevent hypothermia? Absolutely. So if you are able to build a little bit of a lightweight windbreak for yourself uh, that uh, gets you out of the wind, awesome. Even better, if you can apply a passive means to get fish when the ice is there. So Lee talks about that in his uh, intro video, where he puts a net under, um, a, where he puts a net attached to a log, and then he pushes it under the ice and then um, catches the fish, and then he comes back just to retrieve it. So that's an even better way to do it. Another salt question. So, um, should you bring salt for a survival expense or should you bring salt in a prolonged survival experience or even like an expedition? And my opinion is hundred percent. Yes. Number one, uh, dehydration is real and it's really common. Cramping is also an issue and also, uh, cardiac arrhythmia and the end stage of starvation, um, is something that's a real deal. Your heart as, um, as you start taking proteins from your body, you're also taking it from your organs too. So your heart can get smaller. And if you've had any kind of conditions uh, in the past that you may or may not know of, um, and you have electrolyte issues, your heart becomes a little more irritable. So you can have palpitations and, um, and sometimes fatal arrhythmias. So electrolyte supplementations is important for dehydration, um, maintaining that blood volume. Because again, if all that water that you're drinking is just peed out, your blood volume is not going to be the best. And that means your blood pressure might be a little low. So you might be fainting a little bit more, might not be able to perform as well. And in addition to that, you need your blood circulating to feel warm too. So if you're dehydrated or don't have a lot of fluids inside your actual blood vessels, you're out of luck for uh, severe hypothermia too in the end stages. So definitely think it's a wise choice to bring salt, but the right combination of salts. Um, so if you want to find the gear videos for the contestants, look at the History Channel app. That's what I use. I'm in Canada. So that's what I'm using to watch the behind the scenes stuff, the extra footage, and also um, the um, these extra videos. Yeah. So losing your equipment is a real thing out there. Multi-tools fair rods, glasses, all these things are, uh, are real things, especially if they're vital things. So I like um, making little tethers to all my things. So my uh, fair rod was attached to my um, multi-tool uh, in a loop system. And that loop system was kind of weaved through my um, multi-tool holster. So if I was using one or the other, it was always kind of tied to my, my hip. So I, there is no possibility of losing that. So if you have things that are valuable, tether it to your person. Fun tip. All right. So um, that is quite a lot of questions that we have had so far. If you guys like this type of uh, reviews, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's uh, at Survival Doctors. That's with an S. I'll be doing this every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, if you have any questions, this um, live will be posted for review. Um, and you can put your questions over there. Invite, invite all your, your alone friends and trolls and people who are doubting contestants because I want to talk about it because there is a reason for some of the choices that they do out there. And uh, there's some reality and practicality that goes behind um, things that actually happen.
Oh, last question. Has anyone made pemmican while out there? I don't think anyone has made pemmican out there. So pemmican, again, mix of fat, berries, and meat. Um, so if you have all those three and you're not immediately going to eat it, that's a potential because it lasts long. So should production have closer monitoring for their vitals and all sorts of things? Um, I, that would make me happy if I was part of the, the medical team. But uh, again, it's a production decision. So yes, the, you find all these extra videos and episodes on the History app. So I watch it on Fridays, review it, make some notes, and then I have an episode out for you on Monday. All right, guys, we'll see you next time, next Monday um, and potentially on Tuesday or Wednesday. So keep an eye out, um, click the notification because I might be doing an episode one review tomorrow or Wednesday. Take care, guys.